Coming up today on Minnesota Sports Rankum, the top five Minnesota Vikings training camp stories in team history. Next. This is Minnesota Sports Rankum, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. It's the show that settles debates and starts new ones. It's Minnesota Sports Rankum on Locked On Sports Minnesota, a new top five list every Thursday. I'm Sam Ekstrom, at Sam Ekstrom, part of the Ron Johnson Show and the Minnesota Football Party here on the network. I'm joined by my right-hand man, Luke Inman, who's on the left side of the screen. So make that make sense. He's at Luke underscore Spinman. He authors the NFL Draft Buzz newsletter for the Locked On Podcast Network. Luke, it's training camp season, man. One practice in. We'll have a full breakdown of that practice on today's Minnesota Football Party. But today, we're talking training camp memories of the past the biggest stories in vikings camp history because you know it crazy stuff always happens this time of year yeah i don't know about you i went back about 20 years or so i'm interested to see your list because i gotta tell you mine just as i kind of look at it on paper once again it's kind of a downer sam kind of depressing don't get me wrong obviously like plenty of highlights and excitements and great moments over the years but also some not so great stuff we've seen take place as well, which I'm excited to get into with you. Uh, yeah, you, you talk about the ups, the downs, the tragedies, obviously, some sad stories, some negative stories, some fun ones, too. Um, kind of the whole gamut here on this list today. And you mentioned 20 years. I think three of my five go back beyond 20 years. So getting in a little deeper into that Vikings history. Um Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. You can uh, make every moment more. FanDuel.com slash Locked On. Get started today. Uh, by the way, please subscribe, Locked On Sports Minnesota. Help other people find the show. Help us get to 6,000 subscribers before Viking season begins. That would be a great milestone. And we're free and available wherever you find podcasts. And that includes Amazon Fire, Roku, and the Sirius XM app. Number five, Luke, I always give you the lead. Kick us off. Number five on my list, Sam. Boy, how ironic is this one? In the same summer, we see not one, but two Vikings get caught speeding well past the limit. Ole Udo, that was back in May. Now, most recently, Jordan Addison. But they weren't the first to put the Vikings on the map when it comes to some NASCAR racing. Back in 2006, Corin Robinson. That's right. That Corin Robinson. He got caught going to buckle four, trying to make his way back to Mankato right before curfew that night in the BMW. He ends up getting Sam in an actual police chase by the time it's all said and done. And when he finally does get pulled over, he blows a 0.11, obviously over the legal limit. You got to remember this. At that time, Sam, 2006, Childress's first year after Tice, and the whole thing with the Wilfs was – Okay, after the love boat and everything else, we got to clean up our team image. So Robinson gets in this high-speed chase, gets caught drunk driving. Ten days later, he was cut by the team. Despite being one of the top whiteouts on the roster, he was supposed to be one of the top passing weapons again that year. Huge story that year in camp. His wife had to come bust him out on bail the next morning media everybody meets them in the parking lot made the uh you know every paper and news outlet uh throughout the next week and a half corn robinson going fast and furious bit down 169 in st pete's in the beamer while intoxicated mm -hmm. that's number five on my list sam yeah uh i i feel like when we were commuting to mankato every day we might have touched 104 a few times no i'm kidding couple I'm kidding um yeah, no, the the temptation when you get on 169, those kind of wide open roads, I uh, I get it. But yeah, you shouldn't drink and get behind the wheel. That's that's not a good idea uh, ever. But imagine so, losing your top receiver, though, Sam, one week into training camp. You know, that's that's a brutal blow, mm -hmm. obviously, outside the off the field percussions. That's that's brutal for just the morale of the fan base to lose your top passing weapon like that. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, certainly primed to do some great things, special teams as well. He was a big kick mm -hmm. return guy too. So, um, yeah, that's that's something. I'm going to go back 40 years, Luke, 40 years. Less Steckel, 
Les Steckel was going to come in here. He was going to just carry things over from the Bud Grant era, and it did not go that way. First day of training camp, Les Steckel says, all right, let's like get rid of the footballs. We don't need footballs here. This is football practice. We don't need footballs. We're going to have an Ironman competition, eight events. I want you to be crawling in the dirt. Get down on your hands and knees. Um, he literally rode his team into the dirt the first day of training camp practice. Mark Mullaney. You, you wonder where we heard Mark Mullaney recently. He was in the Vikings Legends Golf Tournament video, and we were like, mm. Mullaney, that I, I haven't really heard much about Mark Mullaney. Well, he pops up here. Mark Mullaney uh, pulled his hamstring during the Ironman competition. So did kicker Benny Ricardo. Vikings were getting hurt on the first day of training camp, put through a rigorous Ironman competition, and that started the trend of beginning every practice with 45 minutes of conditioning to begin. The Vikings were battered, injured, deflated by the time the season started, and they went 3-13. and 13. Can, can, You want to guess what their point differential was that year, Luke, in 1984? 1984, 3-13 season. I'll say minus 108. Triple digits, right? Gotta be. You got two of the three numbers there. 208 Oof. was the point differential. Wow. Not great. Not, Not what you great, want. Bob. Not what you Not want. great. The Les Steckel era lasted that year and that year only. And the training camp Ironman competition. And I wonder, like, the headlines at the time, Luke, I wonder if people were actually celebrating him, like, in the newspaper the next day. Les Steckel, no-nonsense coach, you know, shakes things up his first day of practice. I wonder if he was actually applauded at the time. And history has sort of revised how that looks today, which is just ridiculous. That's my number five. The only thing I can say about that is as a big draft nerd and nut, anytime you go three and 13, you're hoping you should be able to get a top five pick, if not top three. I wonder who their draft pick was the following year. That's something I'm going to have to look up after the show. Number four on my list, as far as the actual timeline goes, I'll admit technically, okay, this one happened just right after training camp. But whenever I think about this one, it all kind of blends together in the same time frame, And that's when a first-round quarterback entering the pivotal breakout third year, just going through the motions at practice one day, and to this day suffered one of the most freaky, non-contact, gruesome injuries you'll literally ever hear about in this game, Sam, especially when it comes to the Vikings. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Teddy Bridgewater. Two weeks before the 2016 season, dislocated knee, torn ACL, significant ligament damage at practice. One of those moments, you just never forget where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news. So much hype and buzz around this team that offseason, coming off a division title, 11-5 and five record. I was at work. I look up at the TV. I see ESPN. Re okay, wait a minute. What? What's that say at the bottom scrolling? Teddy Bridgewater suffered a knee injury and my mind immediately goes to glass half full. All right, please just be like a sprained MCL or something like that. Two to four weeks at most. Then all the reports that follow in the coming days, just how gruesome it was that he has sustained life threatening injuries. And without the quick response from the medical team, there was a chance he could have either bled out or lost his leg entirely, which is just so wild and terrible to think about. Uh, Vike straight for Sam Bradford a week later. He goes seven and eight. Teddy, never quite the same again. Obviously, his time in Minnesota was done shortly thereafter. Teddy's freak injury that scarred the Vikes 2016 season coming in at number four on my list. Yeah, I was there that day. I was I was Were on you the really? scene. Wow. Uh, and that was that was the random kind of throwaway practice. It was between the the third and fourth preseason game. They played on a Sunday. And then a Thursday. And the only practice they had that week was Tuesday. So he just had to get through one practice that week um, and then get, you know, probably sit through the fourth preseason game. And then he's into the season um, early in practice, 20 minutes into practice, just doing light drills, probably just handing the ball off a little bit, kind of walk through pace, almost misstep and down. And, and from our vantage point with the media, we really couldn't see the injury itself or what, you know, what the situation looked like with the knee, but the instant reaction players sent off the field, media sent off the field. And then within three minutes, Luke, 
Wee wee sirens, ambulance coming to the facility. Very, very alarming. You don't see that for your run of the mill leg injury. So that that was a, a bizarre, sad franchise altering day, career altering day for Teddy Bridgewater. Uh just crazy. Um, and honestly, it didn't really come to my mind when I was making my list, and that's that's a huge moment. Um, I'm gonna go for number four. This is uh, this is among the fun memories. Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar, 2004, leaves the WWE and says, I'm going to play some football. Might have been a publicity stunt. You know, might have been Brock and WWE. It, it makes total sense that if you felt like you could, you know, maybe have an outside chance of making the team, uh, at least show up and make some headlines. And, oh, he made some headlines, Luke. Vikings made him, uh, made him a defensive tackle. Um, Kansas City Chiefs come in. And remember, the joint practices then, Luke, they they were not walk-through pace. They were hit. They were full contact, hitting people. So Brock Lesnar um, got a little fiery. Dante, I think, had taken some hits. And uh, Lesnar tackles a guy. There's a little scrum afterward. Gets up suplexes, I believe is the word that you use in wrestling lingo, suplexes a Kansas City Chief to the ground. And uh, that was his shining moment. That was the highlight that came from Brock Lesnar in Vikings camp. Got hampered by injuries, probably wasn't very technically sound, did not make the team, but he made the headlines. And that's what's important. He made some memories. Uh, yeah, great minds think alike. That was number three on my list too. Not much to, uh, not much to add there as well, but you're right. Like I'm thinking, okay, what reality am I living in right now? I grew up a huge WWF kid, uh, Hogan, uh, macho man, rowdy, rowdy Piper. Wait a minute. Brock Lesnar, a WWE champion, a UFC heavyweight title holder, uh, a local legend, right? An Olympian wrestler, state champion from the U of M. He's going to drive down to Mankato and try out for the Vikings as a UDFA, I, I lost it. Again, I was like, what reality am I living in right now? Not a publicity stunt. He truly believed he could make an NFL roster. And pull up the combine numbers. I don't know if you did that, Sam. I get yeah. why he thought this. Six foot three, 283, dude runs a 4740, jumps a 35-inch vert, and puts up 30 reps on the bench press. Just for comparison's sake. Those are better numbers than J.J. Watt by a country mile. So, yeah, it was crazy. Oh, and the fact, too, I didn't know this until I looked it up this morning. He put up those numbers, by the way, six weeks after a nasty, brutal motorcycle accident, left him with a broken jaw, bruised pelvis, pulled groin, meaning there's 0% chance he was even close to 100% when he posted those numbers at the combine in May. So yeah, long story short, you mentioned it never really made any splash plays. starts with the third team kind of buried on the depth chart ends up getting cut. But that German suplex man slams an offensive lineman into the ground as hard as he can instant all out brawl, probably the perfect highlight to one of the most entertaining NFL stints. The Vikings have ever seen still to this day. Uh, yeah. Brock Lesnar, three-time WWE champion, Rocking the 69 jersey, playing the L5 on special teams, just sprinting down, knocking dudes' heads off. He's number three on my list, Sam. Yeah, he no, he was the original 6'9 before Jared Allen came That's along. Right. That's for sure. Uh yeah, the bad boy, the uh the defensive lineman. Um Imagine by the way, him screaming down on special teams, though, Sam. Whew. I yeah, I'd get out of the way. I would dodge, I would dive out of his way. Yeah, the, a theme of this list is like stuff that used to happen that would never happen anymore. And and among them, Brock Lesnar suplexing people on the field. Uh, we're at the halfway point. And by the way, I looked up that first round pick in 1985, Luke, that you wanted to know about. No big deal. Hall of Famer Chris Dolman. So, there you go, Sam. So it was all worth it was something all, in the end. Yeah, Les Steckel was tanking before his time. Chess not checkers, baby. He, Les that, was playing 5D chess. I love it. Okay. Had a very Fair unique enough. way of going about it. Uh, today's show at the halfway point, we're brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Uh, you can live bet the 3M Open happening right here in the Twin Cities. Tony Fee now got off to a birdie, birdie eagle start. He's already a heavy favorite, defending champ at plus 360, 
Bet that. Bet baseball. Twins are off today, but you can still bet a full slate slate of Major League Baseball games. FanDuel is the best place to bet baseball this summer. New customers get the following promotion, and this is great. Up to 10 times your initial bet back in bonus bets. Up to 200. So bet 20, get 200. Bet 5, get 50. Free money whether you win or lose that bet. Been, uh, no better place to bet baseball than America's number one sports book. Safe, secure, easy to use FanDuel Sportsbook app or go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get those $200 in bonus bets and bet some baseball, bet some golf, bet some NFL futures at FanDuel. They're an official partner of Major League Baseball. Number three on my list, 1999. Demetrius Underwood on the lamb. He shows up, signs his deal, gets a nice little $1.75 million signing bonus. And Luke, there were already red flags. Remember the, the Vikes were picking late in that draft coming off 1998. Um, Demetrius Underwood was bipolar. Uh, there were some red flags about his focus, his ability to commit to professional football. And the Vikings said, hey, we took a swing on Moss. There were red flags about him. We can do this again. Demetrius Underwood shows up, gets his signing bonus, practices once. Bye-bye. He's gone. He is on the run. Don't know where he is. Um, and it comes out that he's he's done with football, or at least for the time he was. He, was, he could not reconcile playing football with his religious beliefs, and he was talking about the apocalypse. And the Vikings, 11 days later, they waived him. And they did get the signing bonus back, Luke. Back, Luke. Uh, that let's be clear about that. They weren't going to let him get away with 1.75 million dollars. But uh, this just turns in, you know, comical. We kind of laugh about just how poorly that went. Sad story. Like Demetrius Underwood was a troubled, troubled individual. Um, you know, later in his career and life, suicide attempts and kind of schizophrenic behavior. Again, the apocalypse stuff apparently like distracted him from team meetings. He did have a little mm. stint with the Dolphins and the Cowboys wow. who tried to make it work. And he was he was not uh, not cut out for the day to day grind of the NFL. So, yeah, Demetrius Underwood in camp, the first round pick showing up and then leaving one day later. Bizarre in 1999. It's so easy to get down on some of these kids, you know, in the draft world, especially. Oh, this kid's a bust. He's no good. There's a whole human element. And this guy's a human being just like anybody else. And to hear about the suicide attempts, the arrests, the multiple stints in the mental health facilities, all that stuff. Uh, just a, a really gut-wrenching story. And again, I don't know what he's up to nowadays, but uh, hopefully, uh, uh, again, he's kind of got his life back on track. Sam, once he got outside yeah. of this big scene in world of the NFL uh, number two on my list. I'll never forget it. Summer 2009 Brett Favre watch. Think about this roller coaster. This fan base went through man, Brad Childress. He puts together an elite top shelf roster, Adrian Peterson. He's entering year three. He's already a superstar. They leave the draft in April with Percy Harvin and Phil Lodeholt. And the only thing they're missing is a quarterback. They just traded for Sage Rosenfelds. He just came on board to battle Tavares Jackson for the starting spot. And then in July 28th, so one day from today, think about where we're at in the process right now at the start mm -hmm. of camp here, Sam. All the rumors about Brett Favre all offseason, they're squashed. He comes out and he says, I'm not signing with the Vikings. So now the morale's low. Fans are teased. Everyone's bumming out. But then a couple weeks later, Momentum starts to pick back up a few weeks later. Again, after watching T-Jack and Sage kind of duke it out at camp, they turn the heat back on. They send the three captains out to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Hutch, Longwell, Jared Allen. So I, I just keep thinking about the timeline of all this. So training camp, just about to wrap up. You send your three captains on a flight down to recruit a new quarterback with three weeks before the season to start. Uh, the coverage of this whole soap opera was around the clock, 24-7, every news outlet imaginable for weeks on end. They get him to fly to Minnesota, sit down with the brass on August 17th. Vasante Shanko called it, quote, a circus at Winter Park. Bernard Berrien tweeted out Brett Favre for president. That was when Twitter just 
was brand spanking new, Sam. And then in the end, they get their man. Obviously, signs with the mm-hmm. team a few days later. Rest is history, as they say, 12-4 and four, NFC title game. And I think, for me and my money, one of the craziest training camp sagas this franchise and fan base has ever experienced. Brett Barb, number two on my list. Yeah, that's also mine. Now we're gonna have to to go over some of the the particulars of which what happened which year because remember two sagas the nine saga and the ten saga. Mm-hmm. Um, now my memory tells me that the, in 2010 that was the summit in Hattiesburg. That was when Longwell, Allen, and Hutch went down and tried to coax him to come back because remember he had the ankle. The ankle was bothering him from the NFC Championship game. He had to go talk to Dr. James Andrews and get it, like, reassure him that his ankle was going to be okay. His heart didn't seem to be in it. Vikings were were begging him, here, here's more money. Here's more money. Here's more money. Please come back. And then they send the veterans down to have some beers on the patio and coerce him into coming back to Minnesota. Now, in retrospect, was Brett's heart really in it that year? I don't know. But... Was there a more popular sports figure in Minnesota at the time, Luke, than Brett Favre? Like after the 2009 season that he had, 2010 Favre watch, I would argue was even more dramatic because 2009, yes, it was still incredible, but he was also kind of coming off the the Jets year. People wondered, does he really have anything left? He was injured last year. The Jets struggled toward the end. Do we really want this, this washed up guy? So then in 10, after seeing what he'd done, Favre Watch was all the more ardent. People were just dying every day for news. Is he coming? Is he not? Then he said no. Then they send down the veterans. And then he says yes, and he comes back, and then everything falls apart. But those two years, Luke, of just the ups, the, the exhilaration, the, the helicopters following his car to the facility, the press conferences hinging on every word, yeah, you can't get much more dramatic than that. That's certainly in the fun category of camp stories. And and number one, it's, it's a little bit more sad, Luke. Um, take it away. Yeah, number one on both our lists, Sam. Not a fun one. We both know that right now. August 1st, 2001, Vikings Pro Bowl tackle Corey Stringer. He collapses to the ground during training camp practice in Mankato. He's rushed to St. Joseph's Mayo Hospital, pronounced dead after a heat stroke. I'll never forget being a kid and reading the horrific details, though, Sam. I mean, these guys were practicing in the same exact type of conditions taking place out there as we speak this very week, man. I I mean, so when you're out there this week, think about those brutal conditions. 90-degree heat, but 10 heat index, thanks to that brutal humidity. Then you find out his body temperature reached 107 degrees when he finally got to the hospital, uh, threw up multiple times during practice, finally walked inside, got into the AC. At that point, sounds like too little too late, though. Obviously, the medical staff and the doctors did everything they could. But in the end, one of the best players and more importantly, best humans the Vikings have ever had the pleasure of associating with. He passed away in such a tragic way, too, that looking back, It always seems so avoidable now, but you got to remember, Sam, back then practice looked so much different. The two-a-days were real two-a-days, and this event, it really shaped the NFL into what it is today because what followed were so many massive changes and alterations to the way coaches were allowed to practice, the amount of time they were allowed out on the field, and just all the precautionary measures to ensure the safety of the players after you witness something like this take place. So absolute shame. Someone had to pass away tragically first for them to change all these rules. But in the end, I guess, you know, Corey Stringer's memory still lives on thanks to everything he did on and off the field. And still to this day, really every year around this time, whether it's an article or a tweet or a video or a clip, whatever it may be, Corey Stringer's name and legacy is brought up to some degree just to remember his story and how much he impacted the game. So, yeah, the passing of Corey Stringer, number one on the list. And I think, without a doubt, the most somber and saddest moment in Vikings training camp history. Yeah, it's it's really sad that it had to come to that for changes to be made. And, you know, I, th- I think that legally speaking, I, I and, and I believe I'm correct about this, I think they were cleared of culpability legally. Um, but... 
just the NFL culture at the time, I think everybody was kind of acting ignorantly toward the dangers of heat, right? Like this was a two and a half hour morning practice that's that that caused this in Stringer. What? In theory, he would have had to go back out in the afternoon and do it again. Insane. Like this was just the morning practice that did. Yeah. And there were two of these. Two, this is two a days. Yeah. Traditional, fully padded, two a days in 110 heat index. Um, the yeah, body. And just for thing, reference, for people who don't know, now it's just a walkthrough. It's just a light quarter speed, mm -hmm. half speed walkthrough, basically just mirroring and practicing what they're going to do full speed for the afternoon practice. So yeah, I mean to be out there and cover those Mankato training camps and to think about. Those guys, especially the big body dudes in the trenches, going full padded practice twice a day for what 21 practices? That's absolutely insane, Sam. Vikings practice yesterday. I was there. It was individual drills for a good hour, hour 15, and then about a half an hour of 11s, unpadded. I mean, just it's a different world. Mm -hmm. It's a different world from the Steckel era, different world from the Stringer era. And it took a long time to get there, man. They got hydration breaks now. They've got people constantly offering you water on when you come off to the sideline. It's just part of part of practice. It's part of health. Part of keeping your body right is hydrating. And um, yeah, the the string and apparently Stringer had struggled the day prior. Also, that's the sad thing is that he like was fighting it already, and then you know just because of the culture of the NFL was said, oh, I'm going to make it today. And uh, he got through the practice, but at a very, very big cost. And I think his family's come out and said too afterward that, you know, uh, we, it's it it's awful that we had to pay the price for all this change to happen. Um, and Corey's locker was immortalized at Winter Park for years. I don't think they touched it. His locker was just there in the corner um, as a tribute to what he represented. His number, number seventy-seven, retired, obviously. Uh, in Vikings history. So a somber note to end top five wildest training camp stories in Vikings history, a sad one um, among many wild stories in Vikings history. Uh, what's going to happen this year? We've already got Jordan Addison in the news uh, and we're only on July 27th. So plenty of training camp talk coming up today on the Minnesota football party. We'll welcome in Arif Hassan and Luke Braun, Luke Inman as well. Plus Ron Johnson joins us more Vikings talk on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. For Luke, I'm Sam, saying so long on Minnesota Sports Rankum.